Romans chapter 3. Tonight we're going to cover beginning in verse 9 of Romans chapter 3 and we're going to go down probably to verse 20. We may go a little beyond that, but we're going to shoot to, to cap off the study tonight at verse 20. That will leave us room to finish out this chapter and then make some applications on Sunday. And then next Wednesday night, your schedule reflects this, next Wednesday John Polk will be teaching a separate topic. He'll be teaching a different class, not on the book of Romans, but maybe on something somewhat connected to Romans. Something biblical, I hope. Definitely biblical. That's, I have a lot of confidence now. A lot of confidence. Something biblical. Look forward to that. But let's begin with a word of prayer. This, by the way, Romans 3, that's where we are, Romans 3 and verse 9 and following. But let's begin with a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for the blessings that you've given to us. We thank you for our time of study tonight. We thank you for the opportunity to gather. We actually know of many congregations that are not able to meet because of bad weather. And here we are in a place that's both warm and dry and an opportunity to study your word together in person. And we love you, Father. We thank you for the blessings you give. Please be with our shepherds. Watch over each and every one of us. May we make appropriate applications to our lives to better serve you in the kingdom. And pray you be glorified in our efforts. We ask all this in the name of Christ, your Son and our Savior. Amen. Romans chapter 3, verse 9. Let's kind of remember the context. We've been talking this quarter so far. We've been talking through these first three chapters of Romans. I think this is important because right here is where Paul is going to tie all of these little pieces together put them on a nice little package with a pretty little bow on top, and that pretty little bow says, hey guys, you're all sinners. <laughs> so, chapter 1, who's predominantly being discussed as guilty of sin? Gentiles, chapter 2. Jews, chapter 3. Everybody. Now, it's like we've said all along, that's not necessarily... If you went to breaking down the verses, yeah, there's other things being talked about. I, I think really the Jewish discussion plays into chapter 3 as well. That's just that little way I helped you re, uh, remember those things is just how to kind of help piece it all together. So that's what Paul's doing. Gent or Gentiles, Jews, everybody. Well, you get into chapter 3, verse 9 and following, which we're going to study tonight, and that's still what he's talking about, okay? Let's begin reading it. Romans 3, verse 9. What then? Are we better than they? Not at all. For we have previously charged, both Jews and Greeks, that they are all under sin. As it is written, There is none righteous, no, not one. There is none who understands. There is none who seeks after God. They have all gone out of the way. They have together become unprofitable. There is none who does good, no, not one. Their throat is an open tomb. With their tongues they have practiced deceit. The poison of asps is under their lips whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their ways, and the way of peace they have not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. Now we know that whatever the law says, it says to those who are under the law, that every mouth may be stopped and all the world may become guilty before God. Therefore, by the deeds of the law, no flesh will be justified in His sight, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. Now, to try to summarize what he just said would give away some of our answers in our discussion, so I'm not going to do that this time. I do want to throw this out. I tried to make a point of this a couple of times, and I don't feel like I've emphasized it enough. Reading through some of these sections, kind of tough. We talked about that a little bit with chapter 3, verses 1 through 8, didn't we? That's a tough section. Chapter 3, 1 through 8, what's happening? Who's he talking to? Who's he talking about? Lots of things going on. I would advise you, Pick a good translation, New American Standard, New King James, or ESV. Read the text slowly and out loud. We're not covering very much ground, guys. I mean, you could have literally read eight verses in preparation for Sunday. Tonight, you could have read ten verses. So read it out loud, read it slowly, and you'll pick up the pacing of the text, and you'll, you'll begin to pick up on things you didn't pick up on before. What then? Are we better than they? You see, you, you emphasize different words as you're reading it. 
And so read through it one time with one of those good translations I just recommended, then get a different one and read through it out loud again. You'll pick up on different things that time because the text will be translated slightly differently and you'll realize, whoa, that's what's going on here. That's why the NSAB uses this word instead of this word where the New King James does. And, and so it'll hopefully help you see the passage and what's being talked about. Does that make sense to everybody? All right. On your question sheet, question number two, who is the we and the they in verse 9? Jews and who? Gentiles. Jews and Gentiles. We and they. If you actually read, and I think it's the NIV, which I think, I don't even think that starts a good fire, if you want my honest opinion of a translation. If you're using the NIV, I'm not apologizing, because it's, it, it's steeped in Calvinism. But it actually inserts right there. Are we Jews better than they Gentiles, or is something quite like that? So they inject it there. That's certainly fair because that's what he's talking about. As he qualifies it in the last clause of verse 9, we have already charged it both Jews and Greeks, I understand. So the, the question in verse 9 is certainly, we Jews, they Gentiles. Verse, or question number 3, how does Paul prove his point in verse 9? The hint is verses 10 through 18. How does he prove his point? I'm, I'm hearing something. Yeah, how does he prove that point, though, with verses 10 through 18? Say it. Well, yeah. Y'all are thinking too deeply. Believe this or not, you're, I know I had people ask, man, the questions you're asking are hard. Well, you overthought this one. You know how he proves his point? Scripture. <laughs> Scripture. That's how he proves his point. He goes through verses 10 through 18... And he pulls in Old Testament scripture and he proves his point with scripture. Okay? And I've got people, a shock and a ghast looks at me right now. If you hate me, I apologize, but I don't apologize too much. Apparently, now I, I don't apologize. Some questions are tough, but that one, that one wasn't intended to be tough. All right, question number four. Question number four. What is Paul's argument in chapter 3, verse 20? And how would the Jews have understood it? Say that again, Phyllis. Not, not exactly, not exactly. The point in verse 20, and how would the Jews have understood it? No one can keep the law. Partially. Partially. No flesh will be justified in the law. We'll go ahead and discuss that when we get to it. How about that? And then the Jews, how would they have understood that? Well, I'll say now because I'll say more on it when we actually get there. The, the Jews would have found that rather controversial. Okay? But we'll, we'll pick that apart as we get to it. Does anybody have any questions on those few questions we just covered? Anything I didn't cover? Okay. Let's jump right into the text then. In verse 9, what then? What then? That same expression is used several times in Romans, and we've already noticed this because Paul is arguing his point back and forth. He's making up these arguments, he's following these argumentations, and now he's drawing questions, and he's making implications, and he's drawing more questions from that. And, and so, right here, that's what he's doing. What then? What's the conclusion? Well, let's consider, as he's been talking about in chapter 3, verses 1 through 8. So, verse 7 and 8, we talked about a little bit, and the fact that the conclusion some people were coming to because of a grace gospel is, well, we can just keep sinning because God's grace covers everything. And Paul was saying this is absolute insanity. That is not what the gospel should bring. That's not the conclusion you should draw. We're going to have to do better than that. And so, verse 9, what then? Are we better than they? Are the Jews better than the Gentiles? Or, if you want to widen it out, are the morally superior, these people who are living moral lives, are they better than anybody? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. We all are on equal playing field when it comes to our standing before God. As you look at it, not at all. That's the Not at all. Not even a chance. Not even remotely. Why? 
we have already charged that both Jews and Greeks are all under sin. Folks, we're on equal playing field before God. And as the Jew is sitting here reading through this material and thinking to themselves, just like we noticed in chapter 2, we have the law and we have circumcision, we have all of these great things going for us, that was not going to get them justified before God. They didn't keep the law. And so they were just as condemned in the law, they were just as condemned by the law, and before God they were just as guilty before God. And so that's what he's already been arguing. That's what he argued in chapter 2. That's what he argued a little bit in chapter 3. Everybody is guilty before God. A couple of expressions I want you to notice in verse 9. He said, we've already charged, charged. In the context of Romans, we've made this illustration a couple of times. In Romans, especially these first several chapters, we've got imagery of a courtroom. Everybody remember some of those points I've made several times at different points? This is a courtroom. That's the word here, charged. The, the, the accusations are laid out, they are presented, and when everybody looks at the evidence, there is no question all are under sin. All are under sin. In chapter 6, when we get to that point, Paul's going to take some imagery of sin, and he's going to personify sin. Does anybody remember some of the things going on in chapter 6? Sin is depicted as a slave master. Anybody kind of remember that? Yes or no? That's part of what the image here is. That's what he's, he's already starting to use some of that imagery. These people, Jews and Gentiles, are all under sin. That is, under the weight of sin. That is, under the, the, don't take this too far, but under the control of sin. Sin has dominated and domineered and now is ruling these people. And before God, they are charged guilty of these sins. Okay? Everybody follow that? Any questions on that verse? That verse right there is a big one in Romans. Okay? We always talk about verse 23, which we probably won't get to tonight. This one's just as big as verse 23 is. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. That's absolute. That's true. That's what he's going to build his case out of right here tonight with these passages. But that stuff started way before verse 23. It started before chapter 3, verse 9. But this right here is the doozy, okay? Everybody is standing before God as guilty. Have you felt real good and hopeless the last few chapters? Because you're supposed to. I mean, really, like if you're, you know, we're going through this really, really slowly. But guys, when you're reading through chapters 1, 2, and 3 of Romans, what you should be thinking is not how good I am, not how great I am, not how I almost was a bad sinner. You should be thinking, whoa, I am hopeless and helpless and hapless. I have got nothing, and I stand before righteous God, a holy God, a just God, who within his rights can and should send me to hell. I was talking to Russ about this actually this morning a little bit, and we were visiting about a, a particular thing where somebody wants to really emphasize the love and the mercy of God and, and the grace of God. And, and guys, that's there. There's no question that that is there. But when you're reading Romans chapter 1, 2, and 3, you should be thinking of the wrath of God. You should be thinking of how God is just and how God hates sin. Okay? You're sitting here thinking, i got to have something. i got to have something because I'm going to go to hell on my own. Now, we're not going to get there tonight. I'm going to leave you hopeless and helpless and hapless um, because chapter 4 is where we're going to start getting into the good stuff. Anybody have any questions on anything we just talked about? All right, verse 10. We've talked about this already, but I do think it is important as we're working through these texts to do it regularly. When he says, as it is written, what does he mean? Scripture. Specifically, though, to what Scripture is he referring? The Old Testament. The Old Testament. Make sure you see that, guys, because imagine you're a Jew who has went through 1,500 years of rank Judaism. You've had God's Word drilled into your brain, okay? You have 
thought the law of Moses and, and spoke the law of Moses and read the law of Moses. It was your nursery rhymes. It was at your dinner table. It was everything to you because that's what it is to the Jewish people. So when Moses, or excuse me, Moses, when uh, Paul says, as it is written, Jewish ears immediately perk up. Paul, you've been arguing this and arguing that and arguing this and arguing that. Well, now Paul is going to go, guys, we were taught this all of our lives. We had scripture backing up these very things. Now, he quotes from several passages. Okay? I want us to observe a couple of things overall. I, I'm not going to ask you to raise your hands. That's, I always hate that because somebody asks me, raise your hand if you did this. And I'm sitting there thinking, I didn't do this. So my options are lie or admit that I didn't do it. So I'm not going to do that to you. But I would encourage you, when you see a quotation, go back to the Old Testament and read the quotation. It's good practice. It's good practice. All of these quotations, if, you'll, if you did track them down, you probably already noticed, hey, wait a minute, that doesn't read exactly like my Psalm 14 verses 1, 2, 3 reads. Well, that's because Paul is following the Septuagint. We made this point with chapter 3 and verse 4, if you'll remember. Paul is following the Greek Septuagint. And so it reads slightly different in a couple of ways. But they're almost verbatim, almost exact quotations from the Septuagint. There are a couple of times where he changes a particular pronoun or he injects a particular pronoun. He shifts the tense. You know, Psalmist was talking future tense. Paul's saying this, but then he's looking past tense or present tense. Everybody with me on some of that? Okay, so don't let it you know, get you too bogged down, but that's what he's doing. He quotes extensively here from the Psalms, once from Ecclesiastes and once from Isaiah. Now here's what I want you to appreciate. These are Psalms and Isaiah's writing and Ecclesiastes where the Jew would be sitting here thinking, Oh, preach it, Paul. Paul, just lay it out there, buddy. You, that's right, those Gentiles are every bit as bad as what you're saying, Paul. Yes, sir, amen, amen, amen. What Paul's doing is challenging the way they've always understood these passages. Because the Jew is reading these passages thinking, yeah, absolutely. Two, two groups of people in Psalms, right? The righteous and unrighteous, or the godly and the ungodly. Psalm 1, remember that? Psalm 1, verses 1 through 6. That's the way Psalms is, godly and ungodly. The Jew historically read these books thinking, oh, Jewish people are the godly, Gentiles are the ungodly. Of course, everybody knows that. And Paul's saying, guys, you read it wrong. You see, it wasn't Jews and Gentiles, it was, it was sinners <laughs> and a holy God. And so these passages that the Jews looked at and said, oh, see, Gentiles are condemned, Paul's saying, you're condemned. You're just as guilty. These aren't just about them. This is about all of us. It's all of humanity that falls under this heading, okay? All right, a couple of points overall I want you to see. Uh, you're going to notice the extensive, uh, the extensive nature of some of these accusations, but I'll point out a couple of things because overall I think they're important. In these passages, verses 13 through 18, notice verse 13, throat, tongues, lips. Everybody seeing those, those key words? Hold on, let's do this. Throat, well, let me do this. There we go. Throat, I can't point. Let me look at that back one. There we go. Throat, <laughs> tongues, lips. Everybody seeing now what I'm pointing at? And then you go to verse 14, mouth. Verse 15, feet. Verse uh, 18, eyes. Now you think about all those little pieces. He's talking about the totality of man. He's talking about all of a man. Okay, the extensivity of sinfulness. And that's part of what he's addressing in some of these passages. Um, all of man, all of man is, falls under this heading, falls under this accusation. They're guilty of sin before a holy God. Um, there's a couple of other things that are worth pointing out. I'm afraid we won't have time if I get a little too bogged down. I get, you know, I get too excited, and then I start getting way too in-depth. And at the end of the class, you're thinking, you talked for 45 minutes, but I don't know what you said. So I'm going to try to avoid that. But observe some of those points. The first quotation, there is no righteous person, not even one. In the modern English, you have that phrase, there is not a none righteous, no, not one, and all of it is actually put into this bracket as a quotation. But if you went back and read 
Psalm 14, verses 1, 2, and 3, you would actually find the phrase, not even one, is not in the original psalm. Because what Paul is doing here is making a quotation that is certainly appropriate, certainly applicable, but what he's doing is emphasizing it. So there's not a righteous person. And Paul says, yeah, the psalmist is right, not even one. Nobody can claim innocence before God. Nobody. All are guilty. The particular psalm begins in verse 1 with the fool says in his heart, there is no God. Paul doesn't use that phrase, but that is the catalyst. Because that's where all of these other things get, is the person who renounces the fact that God exists. The fool who says in his heart, there is no God. That's where he goes. There is not a righteous person. And Paul says, yep, not even one. Verse 11, there is no one who understands. There is none who seeks out God. I do want us to look at this. Psalm 14, please. I don't think we'll do, do this with all of them. But I do think this is rather important. Psalm 14. Psalm 14. This also reflects the Ecclesiastes 7 and verse 20 quotation as well. But in verse 2, no, notice how Paul quotes from it. Okay, This is the quotation in Psalm 14 verse 2. The Lord looks down from heaven upon the children of men to see if there are any who understand who seek God. And then Paul comes in and quotes this and says, there is no one who understands, there is no one who seeks God. You see what he's doing? He's quoting from Psalm 14, but it's almost as if the psalmist is asking a rhetorical question and Paul in Romans 3 and verse 11 is answering it. God looks at humanity and says, okay, humanity, is there anybody there who gets it? Is there anybody there who's really seeking after me? And Paul says, nope. <laughs> nope. Nobody. There's nobody who gets it. Nobody who seeks out God. Now verse 12, they have all turned aside. Together they have become corrupt. There is no one who does good. There is not even one. Psalm 14, verse 3. They have all turned aside. They have together become corrupt. There is none who does good. No, not one. Now remember what we observed a moment ago. This starts because Psalm 14 verse 1, the fool says in his heart there is no God. This is where you get. God looks at humanity. There is nobody, 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 I said it three times intentionally, who can claim innocence before him. That's what Paul is stressing. Okay? They have all turned aside. Together they have become corrupt. Does anybody else's translation say something different in verse 12? Besides the word corrupt. Unprofitable. Unprofitable. Anybody else have one that reads differently? Useless. Useless, useless, useless. We had a couple of horses we called useless. I mean, they were so bad, if you sent them to a glue factory, they wouldn't hold paper together, okay? If they made makeup out of them, the makeup would just fall off your face. Um, that's probably an unkind joke for some folks, but that's okay. Uh, you, you think about that word. The idea is sour milk. Sour milk good for much? Nope. You might can fool a kid with it if you put it in the cereal, but you ain't going to get very far. Ask me how I know. Sour milk. It's worthless. It, it has no value. It has no profit. It has no being. And so the word the New American Standard uses, corrupt. That's where it gets us. We're going to say that God is not there. We're the fool in our heart who says there is no God. This is where we're going to end up. We are not righteous. That is, we stand justly condemned by God. And further than that, we're not even seeking after him. We don't understand him. We have nothing. That's where Paul's arguing here in verse 12. Now, again, he repeats this. There is... At the end of verse 12 here, there is no one who does good, not even one. Do you think he's trying to stress the point again? Not even one. Now, does that leave anybody out? No. You see that too? Because I'm going to tell you, that's pretty important. We've got to make sure we see the totality of his discussion here. So the Jew who's sitting here thinking, well, Paul, I see your point. But I was a good Jew. I kept the law. I was circumcised the eighth day as a boy. 
I've been a pretty good old boy. Well, did you violate the law once? Once. Then you are justly condemned under the law. Okay? Now that sounds harsh, but I'll tell you why it is what it is when we get down a few verses later. Uh, questions on any of that section right there before we move on? Anything y'all want to add to it? All right. So again, notice the totality. That's from Psalm 14. He goes to jumping really into several quotations now. In, in verse 13, right here, their throat is an open grave with their tongues. They keep deceiving. Let's take that by itself because that's a quotation from Psalm 5, verse 9. If you've still got your Bible open, flip over there, please. Psalm 5 should be just a few pages over. Psalm 5, verse 9. Notice the language again. Their throat is an open grave. With their tongues they keep deceiving. But the psalmist reads, For there is no faithfulness in their mouth. Their inward part is destruction. And here it is. Their throat is an open tomb. They flatter with their tongue. You again see... See the description, even from the psalmist. Boy, you can pick it up here real good. That's, oh, he's quoting from Psalm 5. Okay, I got you. I'm with you now. That's how the Jews saw the Gentiles. You remember in that frame of context? Jews read Psalm 5 verse 9 and thought, yeah, lay it on us, David. Those Gentiles are every bit as deserving as what you say. And Paul's saying, it's all of you. Not Jews, not Gentiles, it's everybody. The, the throat is an open grave. Boy, that just... Nasty imagery, isn't it? An open grave. They open their mouth, and what pours out of it is a, is a noxious gas like a tomb. Like a tomb. You know, that you think of that world, hot, dry, you open those sepulchers, and, and ugh, just, you know, just nastiness. You open, went into a home that's been shut up for a while, weeks or months or years. It's got a smell. Well, that's the imagery the psalmist is using. That's the imagery that, that Paul is using. They open their mouth and it's just nastiness that pours out. And then he repeats that. Their tongues, they keep deceiving. They open their mouth and a lie pours out of it. Remember us talking about that a little bit in chapter 3, verses 1 through 8? You know, every man's a liar before God. Well, it doesn't mean literally, but it does mean God is so absolutely true and so absolutely consistent that by contrast, every man, it's as if he's lying every time he opens his mouth. That chasm between us and a righteous God. The more we think about how good God is, the bigger that chasm should be in our minds. These folks, they open their mouth. It's nothing but nastiness and lies that pours out of it. But, but, but see, he, he goes a little further too because notice the third phrase in verse 13. The venom of asp is under their lips. Does anybody else just read differently? You're looking at Psalm 5 verse 9. Oh, excuse me, not Psalm 5, verse 9. You're looking at, uh, what is it, Psalm 140 in verse 3. Boy, I was going to throw you for a doozy, wasn't I? Psalm 140, Psalm 140 in verse 3. It would do you some good to read the context several of these psalms are pulled from because the accusatory language that's all around these quotations... Psalm 140, verse 3, they sharpen their tongues like a serpent. The poison of asps is under their lips. Somebody else read differently? Viper? Viper. That's exactly it. That's the image. You know, you take these old snakes, and behind their mouth sits their fangs and poison. Behind the lips of these people sits fangs with poison. It eats at the flesh, it eats at the bone, it kills. That's the depiction. And again, we're not just talking about, well, it's, it's the Gentile world, it's the Jewish world. No, it's all humanity. All humanity stands before God like this. Okay, and so that's how he's using it here. The asp is under their lips. And, and again, you see this progressionary language here. And, and even in the psalmists, or in the psalms that he's quoting from, you've got all of these same things happening here. And a Jew would have every bit of, 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 of right in his thinking to say, yep, boy, that's the Gentile world. That's the Gentile world. No, sir. It's all of us. It's all of us. Let, let's move along here. Verse 14. Their mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. That's verse 14. That is a quotation from Psalm 10, verse 7. Flip over there, please. Psalm 10, verse 7. <clears throat> 
Psalm 10, verse 7. Th this one is probably the, the one that varies the most. But I, I, this is part of the reason why I want to go ahead and read it with you. Because, you know, I, you read through some of this, you think, well, that's not exactly a quotation. Well, it, it still is. Okay, it still is. But l let's notice Psalm 10, verse 7. His mouth is full of cursing and deceit and depression. Under his tongue is trouble and iniquity. So you think about that. Paul says their mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. The psalmist says his mouth is full of cursing and deceit and depression. There's a word missing in the quotation, isn't there? The idea is not, though. The idea is actually still there completely. These individuals are taking advantage of their fellow man. Okay, that, you especially pick that up in the psalmist, full of cursing, deceit, and oppression. That's all stuff you do to somebody else. You curse somebody else, you abuse somebody else, you lie to somebody else, oppress somebody else. That's how that works. That's what he's pulling from here as well. They open their mouth, and they're doing nothing but working against fellow humans. Okay? All right. Now notice so far, let me see here, in the previous section, the totality of humanity falls into these headings. Okay? They're not seeking after God. They're behaving in ungodly ways. They're not continuing at all in the pathway of righteousness. And then this passage, it progresses still yet. They're doing sinful things. They're behaving sinful towards each other. But notice at this point, it, it's just, it's just speaking, speaking bad things, saying bad things, abusing people in that way. And then in verse 15, do you see the difference? So verse 15, their feet are swift to shed blood. Do you see how it progressed? First several verses there, 13 and 14, it's just words. Or, it, or it's, oppress, it's oppressive uh, behavior. This one, killing people, folks. That's humanity. Humanity falls into this bracket. They're swift to shed blood, whereas the psalmist in Psalm 1 said, Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor stands in the path of sinners, nor sits in the seat of the scornful, but his delight is in the law of the Lord. And in his law, he meditates day and night. That's what the godly man does. What's this man doing? His feet are not taking him to godly things. His feet are taking him to shed the blood of others. Uh, Leviticus 17, 11, Life is in the blood. You see, godliness and godly people will respect life, blood. Because they're connected. But the ungodly, to which he is referring here, have no regard for life. Have no regard for blood that issues from God. Verse 15 goes down through verse 17, and it is a quotation from Isaiah 59, verses 7 and 8. Uh, let's go ahead and, yeah, we got just enough time, I think. Flip over there, please. You're, you're going to realize, well, I don't know those two verses, but you know part of this chapter. Isaiah 59, please. Isaiah 59. And again, this runs down through verse 17. Isaiah 59, look at verse 7. Their feet run to evil. They make haste to shed innocent blood. Wow. Their thoughts are thoughts of iniquity. Wasting and destruction are their paths. The, path, or the way of peace they have not known. And there is no justice in their ways. They have made themselves crooked paths. Whoever takes that way shall not know peace. You see what Paul does with the quotation now? He, he takes the, the general reader's digest. That's what he's quoting here. Because he doesn't quote it word for word, but he certainly quotes idea here. All right, let's think about that, that phrase. Let's think about this particular debacle. Their feet are shedding blood. Their destruction and misery are in their path. Of course destruction and misery are in their paths. Look at, the, look at this manner of living. Look at this ungodliness, this torrent disregard for God's way of things. Of course, destruction and misery are their paths. That's a no-brainer. Verse 17, they've not known the way of peace. Of course they don't know the way of peace because they've rejected the peacemaker. All right, you still in Isaiah? 
Look up, Isaiah 59, verse 1. Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened that it cannot save, nor his ear heavy that it cannot hear, but your iniquities have separated you from your God, and your sins have hidden his face from you so that he will not hear. Folks, you need to think about that. These Jewish people who prided themselves on a covenant relationship with God, and that's what we've been looking at extensively in chapter 2 and 3, I'm right with God because I'm a Jew. I've been circumcised the eighth day and I've kind of kept the law. Paul quotes from a passage in the Old Testament where Isaiah specifically says, your sins, covenant people or not, your sins have separated you from God because that's what sin does. That's what he's pulling from here. Ungodliness that wasn't just about Gentile people, it's about old people. All people fall into this heading. And here's the undergirding issue that's behind it all. Verse 18, there is no fear of God before their eyes. The word fear here is uh, the same word we get phobia from. Same word we get phobia from. It carries two implications. It carries the implication of reverence and terror. I don't think those are really separate discussions. Because when you know what God is capable of, you're going to revere Him. I, I, Russ and I talk about this regularly. You, you got to fear God. Fear God and keep His commandments. you got to be afraid of what God can do. Don't you realize, folks, that's what we're talking about in this passage? Chapters 1, 2, and 3 of Romans, everybody's guilty of sin and everybody is justly condemned to hellfire by God because God is righteous and holy and we are sinful. That right there is part of the, re the reason why. There was no fear of God before their eyes. Of course, this is where they ended up. It's not because they inherited this sin. It's because they chose sin. All humanity falls into this bracket. Okay, we're going to have to move along here. Verse 19 and 20. Now we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be closed and all the world may become accountable to God, because by the works of the law none of mankind will be justified in his sight, for through the law comes knowledge of sin. Let, let's think about that, because that's going to help explain what we've been talking about. So verse 19, now we know, same expression he's used several times in Romans. This is a common statement where he's going to say something that everybody in this audience would generally accept. His Jewish audience will generally accept this. Whatever the law says, it says it to those who are under it. Huh. That's kind of a duh, I think, a little bit. The law says, the law speaks, the law is addressed to, to those who have it. That's the Jews primarily, but here's the deal speaks to those who are under the law. Under the law. Uh, you think under the law, you need to think a couple of things. Number one, we have a phrase, you're not above the law. You get that? Anybody heard that phrase before? You're not above the law. Yeah, yeah. See, a Jew needed to remember this very point. You're not above the law. You're under the law. You're subject to the law. Here's what the law says. Every mouth may be closed, all the world may become accountable to God. Everybody needs to know this. You're guilty of sin before God. That, that phrase, that every mouth may be closed. Very poignant terminology Paul uses. It, it's the idea of you're in a courtroom. Oh, look at that courtroom again. Yeah, I'm going to keep doing it too. You're in a courtroom... And the judge looks at you and says, all right, offer your defense. And what you do is... That's the idea here. You're standing in a courtroom to present your case before the judge, but you have no idea what to say because you're covered in the blood. You're covered in the guilt. You're covered in an obvious act of the crime. You're standing before God... And, and you have nothing you can say to him. Nothing. Think about that for the Jew. The Jew sitting there saying before God, whoa, 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 wait, wait a minute, God, I kept the law. And what's God going to say? No, you didn't. Did you violate it once? No, you didn't keep it then. Because to have a law, you have to keep it perfectly. Or you're considered guilty of at least one law. Right? That's the way a law works. So these individuals who didn't have the law, well, God, I didn't have the law. You had a law. Nobody can stand before God on the day of judgment and say, well, wait, 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 I'm an exception. 
That's his point in Romans 3. There are no exceptions. Everybody is justly condemned before God. And so the whole world, notice that, all the world. You know the word world is cosmos. You get that? Cosmos. Does that, does that depict a big image in your mind? I think cosmos, I always think the, the, the planets. And that, that's not necessarily the idea biblically, but that's certainly the idea and the scope and magnitude of the statement. There is nobody who is an exception to this rule. Everybody at some point has chosen sin and are thus accountable to God. Everybody's going to answer to God. So verse 20, because by the works of the law, none of mankind will be justified in his sight. Okay, works of the law. Paul uses law in lots of ways, folks. Specifically, sometimes he uses it in regards to the law of Moses. Sometimes he uses it generically to a moral law. Sometimes he just talks about a generic law. I think the point remains the same, generally speaking. It doesn't matter what you do, you are not justified before God based on something you've done. That's part of what he's arguing in chapter 3. And especially Sunday, we'll address some of those very things in the last half of the chapter, last third of the chapter. By the works of the law, you just start telling God, God, I was circumcised. You know, if you're a Jew, oh, God, I was circumcised. God, I made sacrifice. God, I, I made the pilgrimage three times a year on the big feast days. God, I did this and God, I did that. You know what God's going to say? You're still guilty, buddy. Okay? Hopeless, helpless, hapless. That law will not justify anybody. Okay? Well, that's not a good place to leave you on. Stay with me just a second then. For uh, in his sight, nobody will be justified through the law. He's going to piggyback on that in just a moment. But notice the last clause. For through the law comes knowledge of sin. Okay, we're going to see this in the next several verses. The law was never intended to justify anybody. The law was an educator. It was an instructor. Paul uses the terminology in Galatians chapter 3, verses 19 through the end of the chapter. It's a good text to read along with the next section, folks. The law was a tutor. It was an instructor. All it did was tell people about sin, and, and, it, and, and that was it. It was never intended to do really anything else. It was intended to be the schoolmaster to bring us to Christ. Again, that's Galatians 3, 19 through the end of the chapter. With the law comes the knowledge of sin. All right. We're guilty before God, justly condemned to hell, because we are all under sin. What in the world can we do about it? All right, that's where I'm going to leave you. Even better place. You feel hopeless, helpless, and hapless? I hope you do, because Sunday, Sunday morning, we're going to start talking about some positive things. Okay? I appreciate your attention, and, and I'm sorry. If you had any questions or anything, that last section there, we had to ramble a little bit, but you can talk to me about it later. I appreciate your attention.